So could we start with your full name, please? Harry E. Watson. And can you spell your last name? W-A-T-S-O-N. And where and when were you born? I was born in a little town called Courtney, Pennsylvania, uh, in Washington County. And yeah. On 10 20 22. You got a birthday coming up. Yep. I'll be 96. Amazing. And which branch of the military did you serve with? I joined the Army Air Corps because we didn't have an Air Force, but later they formed the Air Force, which was a separate branch of uh, like the Marines and Coast Guard and things of that sort. And what did you do for the Army Air Corps? Uh, well, for, first of all, uh, I worked in a statistical section. I was really good with figures. I had a, a, a real high IQ, and I could do the statistics in my head. So I worked that way, and all the all during this time, I wanted to be a pilot. So uh, then the war came, and they lowered the requ requirements from four years of college to two years of college. I still couldn't qualify because all I had was a high school education. Uh, but they had me take a. a, a an intelligence exam, and I scored very high on it. Uh, the uh, designation on my 201 file was superior adult. Uh, but I still wasn't into, uh, into cadets where I'd become a pilot. But I submitted uh, all the documentation, and it took a while to get it together because they interviewed everybody, including my eighth grade school teacher. <clears throat> and when I passed the background test, I was sent to Santa Ana, California. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, for pre-flight. So this is all the training you need before you ever get in an airplane. And it basically it has to do with a lot of math and different forms. Uh, I passed, I, I, I made it through there, I was at the top of my class, and uh, they sent me on to primary, which was Hammett, California. It's a, a little field outside of, a uh, little uh, airport outside of Hammett. And uh, the aircraft was a, a Ryan PT-22. Uh, and then from there I went to Taft Field in uh, Gardner, California. Excuse me, Gardner Field at Taft, California. Uh, that was for basic, and I passed it and went to Stockton Air Force Base for the finals, uh, and then I graduated. Graduated on the 20th of May, uh, 1943. I got my wings and my commission. Must have been a, a great day for you. It was a tremendous day, Very yeah. Proud. So you uh, fulfilled your dream of becoming a pilot, and um, can you tell me which which uh, Air Force you were attached to? Well, that was a training command there, and during in in the states. But once you once you were sent overseas, <clears throat> yes, it's the uh, airborne. Uh, The 438th Troop Carrier Group uh, in Army Airborne. Is, uh, Do you remember your squadron? Yes, the squadron was the 89th Squadron. 
the 438th Troop Carrier Group. And did you guys serve under a specific Air Force? Yes, well, it was. And, uh, uh, all that escaped me. I haven't had reason to pull it up or use it or anything of that sort. No problem. And uh, what rank did you attain? First Lieutenant. And what years did you serve from and until? Served from January the 17th, 1941, which was about a year before the war started, until I was discharged. I was discharged in October, but I had enough, enough accrued leave to push my, my discharge forward to, to sometime in January of 46. But I wasn't actually doing anything then. You know, I was out. But I, they get, they paid me for all of that and gave me credit for the time and mm -hmm. et cetera. And you're credited with 27 combat missions. Right. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your childhood and growing up in uh, Courtney, Pennsylvania. You said. Yes. Uh, tell me about your parents. Who were they? They're very hard-working people in this coal mining town. My dad uh, came from a pretty good background, but uh, instead of going to college, he went to baseball games at the Pittsburgh Pirates. So uh, uh, he he'd ended up marrying early in his uh, career to the point where he took on this heavy burden because he and my mom became pregnant with my older sister and then me. And then there was a succession every two years. And we had eight, eight children all together. Uh, also, my dad was out of work most of the time. And I say that because that's what I remember. Uh, I think maybe you could give him some credit, but he didn't, lounge around the house. I mean, he was out hustling, but there were just no jobs and no money in the uh, economy. Uh, you just didn't, my dad borrowed, I remember, uh, I forget the year, but he borrowed $60 to pay taxes and uh, took five years to pay it back. He borrowed $60 and took five years to pay it. I learned this you know, later. In, in life. Uh, we always had uh, something to eat, though. My mom, she, she, we lived off of uh, uh, relief, they called it then. And the government would give us uh, different commodities lard and flour and things of that sort, and beans. And then we had everything we could scrounge, which was all kinds of fruits and vegetables and the, during the growing season. And of course, when the growing season was over, you, you're out of that. Um, so it was not a very luxurious growing up. I only had one pair of shoes. I would, I, and the relief would give them to me in August. So I'd have a pair of tennis shoes to start school with. And I'd have a pair of shorts. No, they were long-legged, uh, corduroys, and and then a, a, a t-shirt. And during the year, and that was for the whole year. During the year, why parts of that kept coming off because we'd, we'd cut it off and get ragged. And uh, by the time it's around to the the next time, why uh, it was obvious that uh, I had worn my way through that, that clothing. And then that was put to good use. But there was never any complaints, though. I was given all kinds of small tasks. When I first went to Courtney, uh, we living with my mother, 
mother's parents, uh, because my dad was out of work again, uh, I, I was, I think, four and a half years old. And my dad said, okay, they, he called me Buddy. When he was angry at me, he called me Betty. He told me that from now on, you have to bring in all the kindling wood. So every night you you bring kindling wood so we can start the coal fire in the morning. And that's all we had was coal. Uh, and he said, you have to get water out of the well, not the cistern, for drinking water. And uh, load up uh, three different buckets, coal buckets, with coal of different sizes. At first it was the larger ones, and you, you stuck wood, uh, paper, first of all, uh, down in, and then put the wood on top of it. You had to cut the wood up into stakes and, and start the fire and then place the, the lumps of coal. And it would, uh, catch fire and then just gradually built more and more. We had a coal mine on our property that had collapsed and this one year, and I think it was about 1935 or so, yeah, maybe 34 or 35, uh, we, we were just out of coal and it was a bad winter. and. There was no place to get, to get any coal. Uh, so my mom said, we're going to go open up the mine. So she, we got a wheelbarrow, tied a rope around it, put the rope over her shoulder, and uh, we went out. And of course, I had a, a pickaxe and a shovel and stuff like that. And here the mine had collapsed, the front of it had collapsed, and all of this mud had come down and formed a barrier. And I, I, I first crawled up that mud, and then and I, I got to that little opening at the top, and I wiggled in, and I could, I could see. Once I got in, I could see it from outside. You can't see. Uh, and I told my mom, okay, I can fill the buck buckets. I had to dig it uh, out of the face uh, of the mine. Uh, and load it in a, in, a, in the bucket and pass it up to my mother. She she had walked all, all the way up that slippery slope. Now she had to walk back down it, carrying a, this bucket of coal and put it in the wheelbarrow. Got the wheelbarrow full. Then I came out and I am a mass of mud. It just I can't explain it. Ever. Didn't bother me ever that. I, I I was glad to do my share, and we we did that for we got enough to last us probably a, a month out of it. And, and this is in the middle of winter. Yeah. And uh, you were probably about twelve or thirteen years old. Twelve, yeah. Twelve at the time. Wow. So I imagine it, um, the ground was a bit harder to dig into. In in spots, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. There were there were spots where it was muddy, and it, it was really difficult because I had to hold the, the handlebars of the wheelbarrow, and my mother put it around her shoulder, and she pulled and I pushed, and after a while your muscles in your forearms cramp up. I, I remember that that my arms were they they just cramp and just double up, and but. Got through it, and then when I we got back to the house and emptied the into the coal bin, uh, my mom took me to the cistern. We had a little pump and it caught rainwater off the roof, and she just splashed me down with buckets of water. I couldn't go in the house; it was just I was too muddy. Uh, it's a little, a little uh, more difficult than turning the furnace on today, huh? Yeah, oh my, yeah. Now, uh, aside from all these 
uh, responsibilities that you had. Uh, did you have any, any jobs that were paying you money uh, growing up? I did. Uh, at age 13, I got a, 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 I got a hold of two of my friends from school. And we, uh, during the summertime, we w walked down to Houston Run and uh, stopped at every farm where, that, we, that was there. And finally a farmer, hired, looking for a job, finally a farmer hired us. And he was paying us uh, 50 cents a day, which was big money, boy, back then. Uh, we worked one week, and we got we got paid. And the other two guys decided that they wanted to raise. And you know, we've only been there a week, so they got a hold of Mr. Fawcett, and they asked. They, they said they wanted a raise and pay. And uh, they they did all the talking, and it was back and forth and back and forth, and. I just stood there, and uh, I remember he asked me, would well, you agree with them? And I said, N no, sir. I didn't know what to say. I said, no, sir. So uh, he said, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. You two are fired, and you, I'm cutting your wage by 50, 50 cents. It's $2 a week. Take it or leave it. <laughs> I was dumb about it. I was stunned. Fifty cents was a lot of money. Sure. And anyway, and, and I worked six days a, a, a week then. Anyway, uh, I later got a job with my father's help on a, what is called a tipple, and that's a structure that comes out of the mine and it crosses over the uh, the railroad even though you can dump it in the railroad cars, goes out to the barges and, and loads it into the barges. I got a job on that. And uh, I did pretty well because it was clean air, et cetera. But uh, then things got a little tight, so they started laying off. And to keep me on, they said I had to work in the mine. So I worked in the mine with my dad. Uh, and what a change. It's, it's, I can't ex uh, explain or pass on to you the feeling. When you're in the mine, I mean, you're in the mine. I mean, it's, uh, and back then they didn't have electricity like they have now, they didn't have access to it. Had carbide lamps. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, I made up my mind then, though, that I was never going to go into the mines, ever. I knew that, that my dad had locked himself in, and that I was not, never going to do that. It's pretty tough work. Oh, very, very physical. Yeah, very physical. But I was young and growing, and I got really strong. Uh, anyway, that's the... All I can, although in the summertime, uh, when I had a day off, I helped farmers thrash their wheat and, and barley and that. And uh, that was probably the most strenuous because you, you had a, a thrashing machine. It would go through and, and gather up, uh, cut all the. Uh, oats and barley and, and things of that sort and put them in a, wrapped them in a, a sheave and threw them off and we would come along with a, a truck and throw it up in the truck, take it into the, the barn and th throw it into the thrashing machine and the thrashing machine would separate the kernels from the chaff and all of that, blow it out and all of the, the kernels ran down this one uh, pipe, so to speak, into a, a wooden container that measured, a, I, 
I think a bushel, it's something like that. Anyway, it weighed about 60 pounds uh, full, and you, you shoved it under where where the the wheat and that would come out. Uh, and whenever it got full, you pushed another one against it, and it, it, it took its place. And you had to grab the one that you just evacuated there, and run it over to uh, a bin, and you'd empty it and run back and get there just in time to do it again. And boy, I'll tell you, I never worked so hard. But I, I got fifty cents for one day. Big money back there. I, so the money that you made, did you did you give it all to your family, or did you get to keep any of it? I would say I got to keep forty percent of it, yeah. and and I would keep keep some of it and go to a movie on Saturday. Ten cents and five cents for popcorn. We didn't know we, we did not know we were poor though. Just did not. I wouldn't mind paying those prices today for a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Never believe it. No, no. Never believe it. Now, aside from all, all this, uh, this working and um, responsibility that you had at such a young age, did you have time for any fun? Back then? Mm -hmm. I never had a date in high school. Never went to a prom. I never went to a dance. Even the locals, I, I didn't do it. But the reason was that uh, my sisters, I, I was not a, a very easy child to raise. I would work my sisters something fierce. They'd have dates over and I would just give them a fit. They would call me ugly. and But this one day they really got to me. I remember this very clearly. Uh, they're telling me how ugly I am and all of this stuff. And I, it was affecting me to the point where I wanted to shut them up. I, I didn't really know how to, uh, to go about that. But finally, I'd, uh, there were three of them that were on my case. I turned and I said, Mom! And she had, you can't help but hear what's going on, you know, it's because it's a small house. Uh, and she says, don't worry, buddy, you'll grow out of it. <laughs> and here I am. I, I was being called ugly, and, and she agreed with him. I, I'm ugly. <laughs> that, that affected me all the way through, even after I got my commission and that. Uh, I made sure that I was spick and span, and, and I did the best I could to be the best I could. But I'll never forget that. And we just forgot about it, you know. It, it, you don't, you can't get back at anyone. No. Uh, and did you have any friends growing up? Oh yes, I had one. One especially, his name was Kenny Jones, and he and I would get up at four o'clock in the morning and go out and run our trap lines because we trapped for possum and skunk and weasel and muskrat and uh, all of that. And we would get these animals. The one we, we, I eventually felt sorry for them because all we had was a little tiny gun. It was about a, a half or a third the size of a twenty-two. the bullet. And when you caught something, you'd put the gun by their head and kick it off. And that would kill it, and then we'd have to skin it, and then we put it on over a frame, and hung it out to dry. But you had to scrape off all the fat; you couldn't allow any fat to be on it. And uh, I would say it would take us a whole day to do one, from top to bottom, uh, and we would get fifteen cents on a good one. If you nicked it at all, that, that cut the price way down. Uh, and this is for the fur? That... Yeah, we, we, a guy bought all that and he would drive around to all these little towns 
and buy it from the different people like myself. Mm -hmm. and Kenny and I did that. Also, we uh, we were daredevils. Uh, we, we we used to swim out. We, we swam in the Monongahela River, and uh, we swam naked. We had to, you know, we didn't have a suit. Uh, we'd swim out, and, and if they had a a a, boat, a tug coming downstream, it was usually full, and full of coal, and uh, it would be about the the. Uh, Part we had to get up on was about that far out of water, uh, and we would swim alongside, reach up with our our left hand, and grab because the boat's moving this way, and let it pull us. Up. It would pull our bodies, you know, flat with the water, and then you'd throw the right leg up on that, and then just climb on up. But now here you are, you're exposed to the world. We didn't really care about that part. And the, the people running the, the boat, uh, the tug, they would raise hell and they had to get a water cannon after us and, and try to dissuade us. They couldn't do it. Uh, but and, but the, the, the outside of the barge, and that would be covered with a, a sediment from oil, uh, not that fine, but uh, kind of thick stuff. And it would be all over our body. Of course, my, your mother then just really didn't want to have to do that, but they'd have to scrub you down. Uh, but I remember my dad warned me about it because it was dangerous. Some of the people in town had to told him about it. They called me Bear. Uh, so they say, hey, we, we saw a little bear in Kenny. Jones uh, uh, in the river messing with those uh, barges and uh, my dad warned me about it. The next day I was b back out there <laughs> and that's when I first got the Betty treatment. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought I'd misheard him uh, or read him but no. He let me know that uh, and, and I got a beating about it. But I, I I got a lot of those, and uh, he didn't really try to hurt me. That was one thing. I so I, I was I never really felt threatened. I never felt like any thing that he told me to do that I couldn't get out of. And like I said, I was difficult to raise. So did you and your friend ever get sprayed by skunks? After you trap them? No, but we did. We did catch the skunk, the very first one we we caught, and we skinned it. Uh, and there's a back near the anus, there's this anal gland, and man, that 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 odor is just horrific. Uh, we didn't know what to do with the the pelt because it it really stunk. And the, so we decided, well, let's throw it down over the, the hill here. Uh, but then we had to get rid of the, the body. And we went down on, on a, there was a highway crew doing some repair work. And then one of the culvers where it took uh, all the extra water and that and flushed it down into the river. Uh, we threw it down in this hole, and now we had to deal with the guys that worked there. <laughs> Man, they gave us a fit. They didn't appreciate that very much, huh? No, here's a skunk, and they, they had to get down in this hole to do their, their job. <laughs> and we got off scot-free, we thought, mm -hmm. but not true. We, we had a lot of privileges taken away. So did you graduate from high school? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. And um, what year did you graduate? 1940. 1940. It was May of 1940. And then, so is it almost
almost a year later when you joined uh, the military. Yeah, I tried to join, but they wouldn't take me until I was 18. Uh, so I got a job. And as soon as I turned uh, uh, 18, then uh, they, they paid me. I remember I got my first paycheck. And uh, it was uh, 30 cents an hour, five days a week. That came out to $12. And I was expecting $12. I only got $11.88. <laughs> It took out Social Security. I was livid. <laughs> they shorted you 12 cents. Well, yeah. That's hard work. I had to walk uh, about three miles. And bad weather and things of that sort. But my boss, my boss, he didn't hire me, but he worked as a supervisor. Excuse me. Uh, he only made 35 cents an hour and I thought boy if, if I can just get to be like him I, I have all this extra money hard work it was a junkyard so we were moving we were breaking up barges and you had to start inside and take the wood out and big heavy planks that had been water soaked and stuff like that and then the, the, the welder would come along with his uh, cutting tool and cut it off into an uh, amount where, say, two men could lift it. And then you had to carry it up over the, the riverbank into a little area where they stored all of it. But we lived through it. So you... You joined the military before the U.S. got involved in World War II. Yeah. What was your reasoning for wanting to join? I had been to every foundry uh, and, and, and coal mine. Uh, as far as I, I could go on a bike, you know, with another man. And one of my friends, Red Wheatman, we, we drove to Arizona looking for work. There just wasn't any work at all. Uh, and I needed a certain amount of money to just to exist. Uh, so I talked my mother into taking me up to the post office up in Monongahela. And they wouldn't take me then because I wasn't eight, 18. So that was before I turned 18. And they said, come back. So we went back when, when I was 18, and uh, they enlisted me. And all I did, was my mother they had rolled up uh, one pair of trousers. I had on, a, on the same clothing. <laughs> Nobody thought anything, and it was January. Uh, I, I had to go into Pittsburgh, so uh, I think I had 15 cents in riding a trolley, you know, a streetcar they called them, uh, into Pittsburgh. And I, when I went in, well, that's when I was sworn in and stuck in a, in a, a, a hotel room. I'd never been in a hotel in my life. And, but all these other guys were there too, and we we had about ten of us in this one room, because we we're going out that night, and they took us down to the train station and put us on, and we headed for Lowry Field in Denver, Colorado, and that was the beginning of my military career. And you had your eyes set on being a pilot from from the get. Yeah, and, but but then when I looked around at what I had, to, none of those guys. Uh, I, of the four, the, we b became friends. All of them applied to be a pilot, and they all failed, every one of them. Uh, it, it wasn't easy. You had to have four years of college. And I didn't know anybody that didn't, uh, had college. Uh, so 
I had to do it the hard way. So were at, at the time, were you aware what Hitler was doing in Europe? Were you aware? Vaguely aware, uh, because we, we'd get notice that so-and-so was killed, but they were killed, the first one was killed on Guam, and he was in the Marines, and he was striking in his uniform, man. But before, before the U.S. was even involved, you know, Hitler was kind of taken had taken over all of Europe. Didn't bother me at all. Didn't even wasn't even a thought that the U.S. might get involved. No. So you were already enlisted when Pearl Harbor was attacked. I was on KP. Okay. And so this was early in the morning. We found out about it. It came over a little tiny radio, uh, and uh, I remember I, I was. I had to scrub out these big containers that they prepared uh, mashed potatoes in. And there was a lot of hard, coarse stuff that clung to the sides. So it, it took me a while, but uh, I, wa I, I wasn't in, uh, I wasn't a student then. And most, the, the thing I looked at is, well, now I'll be, get to be a pilot. Well, they did lower the requir requirements to the point where I got in. Once I got in, I mean, it was a piece of cake. I passed everything. But how did how did you find out that uh, Pearl Harbor had been attacked? A little tiny radio. We're, we're in this area where, in the kitchen, uh, and I'm scrubbing out these big pots. And someone said, Pearl Harbor's been attacked. We didn't, even, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. <laughs> I didn't have a clue. But uh, it soon became apparent. And, and then it changed everything we were doing. We were no longer a peacetime army. Uh, so we, we had to buckle down and, and, and get serious. And that, that's it to the best of my recollection. Mm -hmm. So you were you were early on in your your military career, um, and you still had a, a little ways to go until you you earned your wings. Yes, and I graduated like, like I said on May the twentieth, mm -hmm. nineteen forty three, and I then went to a field at Bergstrom Field, Austin, Texas as a transition and uh, in this uh, there were about 1200 pilots that, that came through there they were preparing for D-Day I didn't know why so there were so many of everyone uh, I, I not only graduated they kept me on as an instructor and I instructed for let's say about a year, maybe, maybe longer, it's kind of hazy. I enjoyed it. I learned how to fly then, because I could see other people make their mistakes and learn from them. And and now I was ready to kick ass, you know, because of all that propaganda. So, so. Um, so do you remember some of your first training flights where you were you were behind the sticks, you were in control. What what planes did you train on? C-47. From the very beginning? Very beginning. Okay. I wasn't scheduled to fly, I was scheduled to fly B-24s. And I paid a guy $80 to change. Because everyone was, that graduated on May the 20th, they were given an assignment. And it was for B-17s, B-24s, a a twenties, A twenty sixes, fighters. Uh, I wanted to be a fighter pilot, but I talked to my my instructor at the time, and uh, he said, "Well, you ha have to excel at, at firearms." Well, I didn't want that. I, I wanted to be an airline pilot, and so I asked him, well, "What do I have to do to be uh, qualify as an airline pilot?" They said you got to concentrate on instruments. 
That's the secret. So that's what I did. Uh, so you were you were thinking even beyond your military service at that point. Once I was thinking about my life. Yeah, you were thinking about a career. Yeah, a career. And yeah, and, and it never changed. Um, so you said you paid some somebody to switch. Well, well there were, there were a number of different people that weren't happy with what they had. One guy had was going to fighters, and he didn't want to go to fighters. So he said, this uh, reporting data such and such, what am I bid? And, and anyone, this guy was assigned to C-47s, and uh, he said, what am I bid? And I, I said, $20. Boy, and that was a lot of money then, big time. Uh, another guy said, 40 and then someone else said, 60 and I was choking. <laughs> and finally, I yelled out, 80, and it sold. <laughs> they gave it to me for 80 bucks. And I had a 21 day delay en route, so I got to go home and see my parents. And so that was, that part was fine with me. And was this before or after you had earned your, your Wings. Oh, after I earned my wings. Okay. Uh, that was graduating. Right. See, so so we, we earned, we had, yeah, the 20th is when we, uh, we graduated. We graduated. And it was after I got my wings. So you had you had earned your wings flying a C forty seven. Yes. And then continued continued on with that. So you were pretty comfortable being uh, piloting that aircraft. I I wanted to be part of it, mm -hmm. to do anything that it that needed to be done. And do you remember the the first time you you soloed when you didn't have an instructor? Did, did that, that ever goes happen? yeah that goes all the way back to uh, Hemet. And uh, uh, my instructor had, had toward the close of, of the day, uh, he said, oh, okay, he said, uh, Harry, take it around. And we were in an auxiliary field. And so I took, I j jumped in and uh, took it around this auxiliary field and landed and everything. Everything was fine. And then uh, uh, he said, we'll see you in the morning. Well, in the morning uh, is when they were supposed to start there to solo us. And uh, he, he, didn't get, he didn't get in the airplane or anything uh, at that particular time. But what he did, he said, now, uh, take this around. He said, uh, this is your solo. He, you do a good job and blah, 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 and all that. And, uh, he said, they're going to be taken off from the left edge of the runway and the right edge of the runway simultaneously. So I, that's no big deal. Uh, I went and I, I had to go to the parachute uh, building and get a parachute and then go out to the airport I was assigned to. And I did my pre-flight and uh, then got in it and they started for me. We we had a little, uh, well, back then well, they, they had ground personnel that would pull the, the uh, prop blades through and they would fire on one cylinder, but that was enough to get a couple rotations and that's all you needed and he had the thing operating pretty good. Uh, and so now I'm taxiing to where the assignment, which was the right side of the runway. And uh, I kept going over things. Keep right rudder. Because uh, torque, you ever hear of torque? Uh, when you crank that thing up, that rotating prop will, the torque from it will tend to pull the nose around to the left. Uh, and so 
I kept saying that over and over, and I finally I got, got in position, and it came my turn, uh, and so I I had full right rudder, and you're only supposed to have a maybe about that much. But I, I had full right rudder in, and I jammed that thing in, and the aircraft went, chung, a 90 degree to the left. Now I'm headed for that other line, plus all the parked aircraft, plus the tower. And I was panic stricken. Boy, I, mean, I, I couldn't breathe or anything, but everything was happening so fast, you had to do something. You, you, you couldn't let it take its course. It was not going to fly itself off of there. And I knew that. So I. Uh, I, I immediately stopped it uh, by, by using full right rudder again uh, and, and bringing the nose back around a, a certain amount. Not enough, but, but a certain amount. Uh, and the aircraft was gaining speed all this time, and I'm headed right, to, right for that second line on the left side. And I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just fly o over them. And I did. I, I nursed that thing. I, but I could feel that it w wasn't ready to fly. I could feel it. And uh, finally, I, I, I'm headed right at this thing. And I, I got it around a little bit. Now I, I, there was no room to turn it uh, anymore. I, so I lifted the, the nose a little bit. And, and I felt it bite. The wings inviting the air and grabbing a hold, so I eased it up just barely and, and made a, a real slight turn to the right, and uh, I missed all those aircraft, and I missed the parked aircraft, and I looked up and there's the tower directly ahead of me, and the tower personnel—they're diving everywhere, getting the hell out of there. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Anyway. I missed the tower, and I just kept bringing it on around until now I, I'm lined up with aircraft that are taking off that have been assigned things like I was. I just went out and completed all my training, and I came back and landed, and uh, I remember I parked, uh, at, but there was no fanfare or anything of that sort. Uh, I got out and I had my parachute, and it was, I had a buck and lawn, so it was hitting the back of my legs. It was making it pretty uncomfortable. And uh, so I'm going through all of that, and I look up and I see my instructor and the commandant of the base. I go, oh man, what are they doing out here? <laughs> I soon found out uh, my instructor, as I got closer, uh, my instructor turned and walked away. And that was a bad sign. But and now here's this military captain who he's looking at me and looking at me and looking at me. And I'm still e easing very small steps now forward with that parachute. and. Finally, he, he said, Watson, you may have nerves of steel, he said, but someday they're going to send you home in a pine box. And, that's, and then he turned and walked away. He must have seen something that I didn't see. <laughs> and that's the truth. Experience. Scared the hell out of me. <laughs> I was worried that I couldn't get it up in the air. Uh, it, it wasn't enough roll, enough power. But you learn from your mistakes. Oh yeah, that's why I went from when I graduated from there. Why I was able to do the best I could at uh, Bergstrom Field, and they kept me on as an instructor. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> tell them tell them what not to do, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, when did you eventually? I'm assuming you you were sent to England once you were yeah, um, not right away. Right, but once you left the United States, were you headed for England or did? Well, tell me tell me where you went. D Day hadn't started or anything of, the, of that sort. Uh, Finally, they did. I, I volunteered for overseas, so I volunteered, and so they assigned me with a crew uh, and an airplane. I got a brand new airplane out of uh, uh, a field in in Ohio. I forget the name of the field. Anyway, uh, I was given a flight check by an, an airline captain because that's who they had in charge of the C-47 program. Uh, and we went to a, whatever was necessary and, and he signed me off. Clear to go. So the next morning, man, we're out bright and early and I've got my crew, my brand new crew. I'm the youngest one of the bunch. I had a navigator and he was probably 27, 28. Uh, a radio operator, about the same thing. My co-pilot was two years my senior, uh, and but it never bothered me a bit. I, I didn't care how old they were or what. I had a lot of experience by then because I had uh, by years instructing. So we took off, and and the first place was a. A Grenier Field in New Hampshire, and we spent the night, and then we got up the next morning and headed out, and we went to Newfoundland and uh, Iceland, and from uh, it seems there's another field in there somewhere, but it's across the, nor the northern Pac uh, Atlantic. And we're scheduled to land at Shannon Ireland, and we made it. There were a couple of planes out of the whole armada. There were a couple of planes that didn't make it because inexperience, strictly inexperience. They used their uh, isopropyl alcohol to de-ice their uh, their windshield and their wings and. What else did they use? Oh, the props. And what you'd do, if you didn't de-ice the props, they would gather some ice on them and become unbalanced and sh shake that engine completely out of the wing if you didn't do something about it. Well, there was something you, that I learned while I was instructing. So, so I, I didn't have a... a Bit of a problem with it. Anyway, we got to, got to Shannon, Ireland, and uh, they uh, put us on a train to Greenham Commons. Never heard of it. I thought I was going to war, but uh, no, it, it was Greenham Commons. And uh, after I got there, which was uh, late June. Of 44, or it, it may have gone been a little, little before then, right? If you, because you flew into Normandy on, on no, I didn't make, uh, I did not make the uh, initial drop, and there's no waiting. I mean, if you're not there, was they assign someone else? So we were. We we got delayed in Iceland six days. Uh, I did not make the drop on D-Day. Uh, uh, right after that, uh, I, I got all kind of combat missions and everything. But they needed me then, so they used me. Uh, otherwise, they they're not going to hold anything open. This was a big deal. Uh, 
and I used that cap that was given to me on a uh, reunion uh, because I'm allowed to say that I represent the 438 and the 438 was number one on D-Day but I, I wasn't there although I got a uh, a merit badge and so did everybody else, my whole crew, everybody. That's just the way they, they worked it. And uh, come to find out, being a, a pilot uh, to most people doesn't mean anything. They didn't know what it was. And uh, as far as uh, D-Day, if you weren't a Marine uh, or a soldier and uh, departing, from the boats and walking in and having your buddy killed, uh, then you weren't part of it. It's just that's just a mindset people have, and I got tired of explaining it. But it was discussed in great detail by people in the reunions because we had all the brass there. Uh, it's just, I got credit for it, but I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to take anything away. We lost a lot of uh, glider pilots, for instance. So it, it was a, a, a paratroop drop that was after midnight on the 6th. And then that afternoon, towing gliders and uh, lost a lot of uh, gliders, lost a, the entire glider. Uh, and some of them didn't make it back. Some of them did, and they had hairy tales to tell you. But it wasn't long you know, before we were off on other missions. And Anyway, that's the truth. Can you imagine what it would have been like that, that early morning flying in? No, our, our outfit l led the invasion, but they made mistakes, and they they scattered their troopers, the paratroopers, over a wide area, and that's a no-no. Now I'd been an instructor, so I knew that. The one thing you had to do is you had to have a, a cohesive pattern. So when they get on the ground, you've got 18, a stick of 18 paratroopers, or so does the, the other two ship in your element. And so when you got on the ground, you, you should have 54, and they should be close together. These are scattered over 20 miles. A bunch of them didn't make it. And when did you make your, your first combat flight? Uh, there's a, a little tiny uh, French town that uh, the engineers had captured and uh, they were running short of fuel. So uh, the first... On the first one, I was the only plane because the, the rest of them had been beat up pretty bad and they weren't available. And St. Mir Iglis is the name of the little town. The engineers put out, uh, they leveled off a, a, enough area to put steel matting down and I landed on that steel matting. Uh, and that was my first combat mission. And, you know, there's a funny feeling in, your, in the pit of your stomach when you left New Hampshire. There was another funny feeling when you left on this flight because now this is real combat. It's going to be real combat. And a little bit of an apprehensive feeling, but no fear. 
Anyway, we got on the ground and someone had to unload that thing and I wasn't about to do that. So I told him I wanted a, a Jeep and a driver. So we're gonna drive around and, and get souvenirs and stuff like that. And there was a huge pillbox right next to this airport. Uh, and so we got the Jeep driver to take us down there. And when we climbed, it's all concrete. We climbed up a few steps and then into this area and then up. And we came to this one wide open area and right out in the middle is a, a rifle and a German helmet. And it, it looked like a setup, you know, like I've been booby trapped. Uh, the the uh, drive, Jeep driver wouldn't touch it, wouldn't go near it. And I wanted a souvenir, so I went over and I looked around and I got down on ground level and I couldn't see any wires or anything attached to it. And I, I, I made it all the way around. And it looked like what it was, which was the guy left his helmet and his rifle and uh, oh, a, a, a grenade. They're called pota potato mashers. Uh, and left a grenade. And nobody would hang around while I took moved it. They said, we'll watch it from over here. <laughs> I got in there and I ran my fingers and I couldn't feel anything. And finally I got it all the way around. Now I had to lift it up a little bit to see, because maybe it's the, the triggers inside that. And everything was fine. I ended up bringing that, the rifle and the, the helmet home, uh, the t potato masher. We w walked out, oh, maybe five yards and now we're looking down over. And you pull this uh, little loop made of cotton fiber, and, and then you throw the, and there's so many seconds it takes for it to go off. But it's uh, of a size where you had to have some strength to, to get it out away from you. You didn't want it to fall where you were. So I did. And man, the blast from that thing. It didn't go off though. I threw it and uh, and you use a, a straight arm. You don't bend your elbow or anything. And uh, as hard as I could. And it went up in the air and then started down and it went down and down. And I'd about given up and suddenly it had a tremendous blast. Um, and that was it. And I got to send the, uh, the rifle home. Uh, you still have it today? No, one of my sons uh, <laughs> did something with it. They, 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 nobody was, was into that. Uh, I mean, everyone had been to war, everybody. So, so they weren't into that. And uh, do you remember the date? of this first mission that you flew? You know, I don't have my uh, log book, so I, 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 it's there in my log book. The guy that was writing the book has my log book. Okay. And he was using it to back up everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to lock in other uh, things that that happened at the time. Um, it was probably in uh, July, and it, it was June the sixth uh, that uh, D Day. Mm -hmm. And you you mentioned that you were the only plane on that mission. Yeah, there was just just one. And they needed whatever it was we had, they needed. So we just, you go do it and get back and go to lunch or dinner or whatever. You, uh, and you never disobey a, a, an order. <laughs> you broke that rule too, huh? Yeah, I did. When did that come about? 
Was that more towards the end of, of that, your missions, or was that that came about on? near the end of August? Okay. Now, see, it was June, July, and August, and, and August is when uh, uh, Paris fell, and. Uh, there, there was a complete realignment because we were supplying patent, and there was a complete realignment of of uh, the assets we had, the the, the all of the, the supplies that you need, and it, it was everything. Uh, and it's still pretty hot weather there in in uh, August. <coughs> So tell me about that, that mission where you, uh, you disobeyed orders. Okay, uh, this was uh, near the end of, uh, of August, and we got a, uh, at dinner time, we received a, a notice that there would be a meeting in the morning uh, on the de debriefing tent, uh, it's such and such, and we'll see you in, in the morning. And the morning came with all the crews. Uh, we had 126 airplanes in five squadrons, uh, and they said that you know we, they're using up uh, the fuel faster than we can supply them, and so we're going to have to. First, I have to have uh, fuel and blood, and uh, they had it all ready to go, and take off would be probably about nine, I would say. Uh, and they will reconnoiter and, and head up and, and fly to Orly. Orly was a, uh, a, a, an airport outside of Paris, or north of Paris a little bit, I, I think. It, it, was uh, anyway, uh, I had not been down low uh, on the continent, you know, dodging uh, trees and cables and things of that sort, and I didn't think too much about it. We line up, and I, uh, here I am. I'm at the tail end. I have three ships, mine and these other two. And then all I do is I place place myself in a, in the proper position, and they, that makes them there also. But everyone in front of me did the same thing. So we're, we're heading. It takes a long time to uh, round up uh, because taking off they can only handle one every seventeen seconds, I believe, is what it, we figured that out. Anyway, um, we're just we're, we're all pretty well hooked up, and we're headed. Uh, we we depart the coast of uh, Dover. Uh, I think is where the, where we departed, and we head out over the channel. And it was about then that we got a, a call on the. They have a, a hotline. It's an emergency, and it's only to the commander of the uh, uh, group of all five airplanes. I mean, he he's in charge of all of it. And uh, the message that came over was abort, 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 and then it goes dead. It goes silent, and then it, it's acknowledged by starting with the the top ranking officer, and these were all. The, Five squadron commanders is what they were. They each acknowledged they, they're, they're going to abort. And I'm on the, the 89th. The 90th was, was, was the last squadron that day. Uh, I, I had this funny feeling that why should I abort? This airplane is in great mechanical condition. I know where I'm going, and I know I can get there even if there's fog. Uh, I'd made zero, zero 
approaches before, not landings, but approaches. And I knew I could do it. So I, I turned to my crew and I, I said, get, bring the two nurses up front. So they came up and I said, we've been ordered to abort and go back. And I said, we'll, we'll lose this blood because if it, once it starts thawing out, it's no good anymore. Uh, and I said, I can make this. I'm willing to go ahead and fly this mission to its end. And if any of you don't agree with this, we'll abort, abort the mission and we'll go home, back home. And to the person, the, the, I remember I had this navigator. He, he was the first one to pop up. He said, we're with you, Harry. And then the, the crew chief and the two nurses, uh, they all said, we're with you. So how many crew members are on board your C-47? As a rule, you have a co-pilot, then you have a navigator and a crew chief, and uh, and then there's when you're doing your uh, gliders, there's one other person that's with you. So and, generally four to five. Yeah. On board. Plus yourself. And in this, this instance, you were also carrying two nurses. Right. And do you know about how much blood you were? You were yeah, 4,000 pounds. It's a good amount. We were loaded to the hilt. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of uh, power to get off the ground. And because uh, 25,200 is standard commercial weight, uh, uh, the maximum weight for takeoff. But we were running it around 27, 2800. And uh, that's a lot of extra weight for a, 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 that, uh, what was it? There was a Pratt & Whitney, uh, I can't remember how it It was a Pratt and Whitney. And I don't, I'm trying to think of, did we have a, a method for getting the last ounce? But I didn't, I didn't need to do that. When I said, I'm going to make a go, uh, I take a crack at it. And I just peeled off then, and I, but we signaled, hand signaled the other two aircraft, because there was one on my right and the other on my left, and told them you know, to stay the course. Uh, and we went, we, I went down right on top of the water and as we approach the coast of uh, France, those cliffs are, they rise a long way out of the water. I mean, it, it's not just level land or anything of that sort. I, I, as I came to it, I had to, re I remember I, I had to add a little bit of power to get up and I wanted to stay about 15 to 25 feet uh, above the, the terrain. But I don't have an automatic uh, anything, uh, so I had to guess it by eyeball. And I, and I briefed the crew, and I had told my co pilot, okay, from now on we have a, a job. We've got to keep our eyes peeled. So you take the right side, I'll take the left side. And I had the radio operator do me the, the left side back a little way. And, the crew chief on the right side. And what this did is look for cables, trees, little valleys where you know where it'll go down and then come up just pretty steep. 
uh, you can get yourself caught in that and where you can't get out. Uh, so I said, if there's something out there, we'll hit it. So we, we've got to do the best we can to avoid it. And they said, no, no big deal. Well, we flew for a couple of, two and a half hours or so. It's a long time. It's a long time to be keyed up and on, on the edge of your seat. Nerve-wracking. It is, and in my mind was saying, I don't know whether this was a good idea or not. Uh, so you but already committed. Oh, uh, absolutely, I've already committed. Hey, we, we, I remember that after two and a half hours, uh, I was beginning to think, well, maybe we'll violate blackout, uh, radio blackout when I passed directly over a British air base. And I, I was sitting on top dead center with the controls and that, so I whipped it over as hard as I could to where I look at the left side and I would be able to see the wingtip and the field. And uh, I could see they had runways and with mortar holes all over the runways and that. But I dropped the gear and the flaps and came around and landed. And now we had to be careful not to taxi into one of those. Otherwise, it would have wiped that gear out. Uh, they sent us follow me jeep and guided us in. And I, I remember even, we, we couldn't see the, the administration of the building or tent, uh, so I, I was concerned about you know, what was going to happen. Maybe they're not open, might not be anybody on duty. But as it was, we walked in, and Alimi said, "Ah, you Yanks, not even the birds are flying," <laughs> and those are the exact words I remember. And uh, he asked us, you know, "I said I need to follow a flight plan." So he said, okay, do this, 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 and this. So we taxied in, and we got out of the aircraft and went in. And uh, they wanted to know where we were from and what we were doing. And, uh, the usual stuff, which was normal. And we told them, and they said, well, you're in, you're in luck. Uh, Orly is about 20 minutes that way. And he said, we'll give you some maps, and we'll spot you clean here, and you're on your own. And so we went and, and took off. And as I was getting, since I knew I was tw about 20 minutes out, at 10 minutes out, I turned on the radios, because I had to find out where I was and, wh and what was, whether we even had a range approach. And, and we did. They, they, and, but they also informed me that they had uh, a stack of aircraft, four-engine aircraft holding from the ground zero up to, up to and including 12,000 feet. And uh, so what I did, I, I, I was going straight for the outer compass locator. So you have two, you have an outer compass locator and an inner. And that helps you set up your landing pattern. So uh, I knew that to be holding at even altitudes. So I just chose something like 4,250. So I, or maybe 4,500. I don't remember what, what it was. But um, we reported over the high cone. And man, all these. C-47, C-54s, four engines, uh, C-54s. You should have heard some of the names they called me. They didn't want anybody in there upsetting their apple cart on it, or that might run into them. Mm -hmm. As someone that fully shouldn't be flying. I had, I, I, I had it all. Anyway, I started what is known as a procedure uh, by getting on on the the beam 
and riding it out for 45 seconds and then doing my 45 degrees left and then 180 back around, come back to the beam, but now I'm headed in the right direction. I got right on the beam and passed over the high cone and then approaching the low cone. The low cone is down about 300 feet. I mean, it's, uh, it's down pretty low. Uh, but I had briefed my co-pilot. I said, now, uh, here's something that we can't make a mistake on. I said, when you see the runway, you call, you, you tell me, runway in sight. Make sure that you can actually see everything about the runway because uh, if I look up and it's not there, then for me to get back where I was, we may not, we may buy the farm, really. Uh, you, you can't do it. You can't look up and then go back and, and then have your mind assimilate all of it. Uh, so I said, so you, if you say you say it, you, you wait and wait and wait until you're absolutely, you can see it and you can see the runway. And I just kept going lower and lower, and we got down to about 100 feet. And I called out to the crew. I said, okay, my 100 feet, I'm going to go down to 25 feet. And we got, so I, I, I had 12, I had eight miles to go. Uh, and that, that's four minutes. Yeah. Uh, so I knew I had a lot of time. I just kept letting down a little bit at a time, and uh, they kept calling out the altitudes. And finally, uh, he said that we're at uh, 25 feet. And then I heard him say, I've got the runway. And the runway was right there and directly in front of us. Uh, we we uh, landed, but I mean, it was a piece of cake. I mean, anybody, anybody could have taken that aircraft from that point and landed it. Uh, and we need to go to lunch. What, huh? We need to go to lunch. So, um... <clears throat> When you had initially received orders to abort this mission um, and you had continued on and the other planes turned back, you mentioned there were 100, 126 total, total? And I was one of them, yeah. And you were the one that carried on. Yeah. So the other two that were, were following you in formation, they turned back to England as well? No. Or did they follow? Uh, they, uh, oh, excuse me. They turned back to England. Yes. So you were the one and only plane. Yeah, right. That and it, it, it was supposed to be that way. One plane could make it. Mm -hmm. But if you had two or more, they'd run into each other uh, because of limited navigation facilities. And most of the pilots couldn't fly instruments properly. Mm -hmm. They just couldn't do it. They hadn't been given the training. Right. So... When, <clears throat> when you heard uh, abort mission, abort mission, and you, you talked to all the members on board and you yeah. guys had decided to carry on, um, did you receive any other uh, messages once they realized that you, you hadn't turned around? or They didn't realize it for a long okay. time because I was the end. So from that point on, you, you just kind of snuck off. In yeah, I snuck off. But in <clears throat> sne sneaking off, I... Uh, I'm flying along, and then, w then when it came time to to bail out, uh, I had my two uh, members of my crew signal the others to, you know, give us space, lots of space. So they peeled off, and then all I did is I just peeled off and went down. I got right down on the the water, and. Uh, I, I knew then when I when I saw things, but I saw the the cliffs ahead of us. I, I knew that I was in for a tough time, because, and I didn't do anything about it right away. Uh, in following Sue and, and climbing up these cliffs, I 
I had arranged with my crew that I would be just barely above treetops, but that it's crucial that we not hit anything. Even if it's just a tree limb, we can't afford to hit it. And the reason why the mission was aborted and the reason why you guys were flying so low, you stated, because vis visibility was... And zero. Yeah. Sailing and visibility zero. Uh, but that's what it was. Um, so for uh, a few hours, you said about two and a half hours, you guys are flying just, just above the ground, just above, above the treetops. I, I think it's two hours and 36 minutes is what I logged in my logbook mm -hmm. until we got to that British base. And now did it end, and did, when you approached the base, did the, the, were the skies cleared up a bit, or you, nope. just, happened to, nope. you just happened to fly over? I happened to fly over through the grace of God, because here you have a, a base that's uh, two and a half hours from where you take off, and you 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 can't fly a heading that straight. So can't, any, any slight variance in direction, and you miss it entirely. Oh, if if you were one degree off, we would have missed it. So God got me through on that one. He saw he had a real idiot on. <laughs> And so he had to help him a little bit. So because you weren't aiming for that air base, to I didn't know it existed. Uh, and this that that base was twenty miles away from the one that you twenty were minutes, headed, twenty minutes, so yeah. forty miles, uh, roughly. Two and it's um, <clears throat> two miles to two and a half miles a, a minute. Mm -hmm. And and there, so if you if you hadn't had reached that British air base. What do you think your chances of reaching your, your target destination would have been? I think I would have made it. Uh, I would have eventually locked in on the outer compass locator because we could identify it. Mm -hmm. um, and if we couldn't, I had um, a, a new map now and I knew where I was and I'll just plot a course directly to the outer compass locator. I would have made it uh, if I had someone as a wingman. I wouldn't be able to do anything because you're hampered by your wingman, uh, and you just can't do it. So it's better that you were alone. It's the only way I would have done it. Yeah, was, was alone. And when you, <clears throat> what was the air base or the town that you landed in again? What What was your target destination? Uh, what was the name of the... Oh, uh, uh, Orly, Orly, Paris. Yes. Um, and once you arrived there, what, how was your welcome? Well, you we, we, we got on the ground, and a DC-3 sits with the two forward wheels up front and then the tail wheel. Consequently, it's at an angle from uh, strictly uh, perpendicular or what. Anyway, it sits at an angle so that the cockpit is looking up instead of straight ahead. I couldn't see anything. All I could see was I, I got the thing on the ground, and as soon as the tail came down, I realized what I had. Mm -hmm. I had to s s shut her down right there, so I did. And uh, I s sat on the runway, and uh, I had the co-pilot call the tower, and tell them that we're on the runway, we needed taxi clearance and assistance. And they said, we'll send a Palomé Jeep. So they sent a Jeep out, and he came down. Uh, if I'm facing this direction, he was outside and down in, in this position. And I just followed him around until we got, he got us into the parking area, and they unloaded the, the, the two girls plus the the blood, uh, and then I, I went down into uh, operations and filed a flight plan for Grove, and I, I did this just for the fun of it. I didn't I didn't think I'd ever use it, but uh, they they decided that they were going to load me up, and they they did. They loaded me with twenty eight 
with her patients. And, uh, I, my, my crew wanted to stay in Paris, even though it's just brand new and still had Germans running around. Uh, they wanted to spend the night. So I said, okay, the only thing I can do, I said, well, we're all loaded. I said, I'll, I'll call uh, ground control and see if they'll clear us. Uh, I got a hold of ground control and said, I forget, 769 uh, was the, the three digits. Ready to uh, taxi over IFR Grove Airport in uh, England. And uh, he started reading me some of the weather and stuff like that. And I said, I'm fully aware of what the weather is. And I, I said, but from what the weather is, it tells me that your field is closed. And uh, he knew I was only a, a, a lieutenant. So he said, Lieutenant, you got that hog in here and I take her out. <laughs> and that was it. I, I had to go. That same day that you you just gotten in? It, within minutes <clears throat> of saying that. He was right though. I was pulling, I was yanking his chain and he knew it. Uh, so we called for a follow me jeep but they led us out to the runway again and I was flying and I poured the coal to her and I got the tail up as quickly as possible because then I'm level. Yeah. I can see really well, uh, see everything. And I'm just concentrating on a center line of the runway, just the center line itself. Stay right on that center line. It was a piece of cake. We, we rolled uh, not very far, but it, and, and we're empty except for a couple of 28 litter patients. Anyway, I got off the ground, we put, got the gear up and we're, we're climbing. Now my altitude was 4,500 feet and we're headed west. And while we're on the ground in Paris, uh, we're, we're a long way down, 40 some thousand feet. Uh, it's gloomy. There's, there's no sunlight coming through or anything. But as soon as we got up above all of this and, and I uh, settled down to my altitude, well, here came the sun. And we're headed right into it, so it's bright. It's bright inside the, the, the aircraft. And all those uh, 28 litter patients cheered. They all cheered. They, they knew they were going to be out of the war for good. And so we just kept on, and it took a while for us to navigate our way to England uh, because of the. Uh, I didn't have a, a, a map of England, or the UK as we call it, the United Kingdom. Uh, but we located a few things up from here, and everything's black. There are no lights. Because you're coming in at night time. Yeah, but you don't have any lights on because the Germans will nail you. Right. Uh, so we we got we got the job done, and it was fun. I I felt so good when I landed at Grove. Right. So you were saying when you you landed uh, back at Grove, you said you felt so good. Yeah, because now we're on solid ground. But coming into Grove, uh, everything is black. I mean, you, you, you can't identify anything, nor is there anything to offer you comparison uh, for depth or something of that sort. Uh, one of the nice things was, was on the way in, uh, they were, instead of going routing us to Grove, because that didn't have that much traffic, they had another uh, airport that they were uh, vectoring me to. And I just uh, stayed with them until finally they, they said, you should be able to pick up a, a darkie. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're 
terminating the the, the, the uh, traffic uh, information. So then I had to stop what I was doing. But in the meantime, the airplane is still moving, yeah. and uh, I had to tune in uh, a Grove, and we could pick it up. And then I had my co-pilot call, "Hello, Darky, Hello, Darky. This is Slow Gen G George, uh, Final Destination Grove." And they came right back and said. The area was socked in, but we would be able to recognize the destination by a bright white light on top of the overcast. And so we, we just kept flying, and uh, when, when you get off course, they have you, have you do a, a, what do they call it now? Well, it'll come to me. Uh, anyway, we, we were now we're headed for Grove, and we're in contact with them, and we got to a point where we were cleared to lower to a different altitude, a, a lower altitude, simply because Darky, which was part of the navigational system. Uh, knew what the elevations were around there, and we were able to duck, duck down and stay ducked down, but keep that white light in in, in our periphery. Any, anyway, we landed. Now we have to go to Greenham Commons, and we have to do the same thing at Greenham Commons. And it, it was a piece of cake, really. <laughs> so I just want to make sure I, I understand correctly. So after this two two hour thirty six minute white knuckle flight uh, to yeah. France. You drop off the blood and the two nurses and then he said just for fun you file the flight plan back to England. I didn't think, yeah. You didn't I, think you would, you'd get sent back? I didn't think they would clear. So, so you clear. find out after you file the flight plan yeah, that I've, they've got your, your plane refueled and, and loaded with 28 litter patients. Soldiers who had been wounded Yep. Mm -hmm. Ready to evacuate, and they say you got to head back to England. No, they correct. No, uh, they're clearing us to England. Uh -huh. When once they unload our aircraft on the ground yeah. in the the cargo area, and they load on those litter patients, then the aircraft's mine. And I get clearance to taxi to take off, and they send a follow me jeep, mm -hmm. and I take off. And, and as I get up to forty five hundred feet, why well, here comes the sun? But you, do you you don't have a choice whether or not you're you're flying back to England at that point? You said right. I mean, they they got your plane loaded up with. Well, I I, I use this partially as a, a lever against my crew. They wanted to stay, yeah. and I didn't want to disappoint them, but I also didn't, I didn't want to mess around there any longer. Uh, buzz bombs hit all night long in London, and Grove's not very far from London. Uh, anyway, uh, I had a, when I went in and found a flight plan, uh, I, I wasn't in contact with the enlisted men in the Air Force who handled all of that. But I didn't think I was going to be cleared. So when I called for, for taxi clearance, uh, I, my first uh, response to them when they said they cleared the session, I told them that I thought that they were, uh, the field was closed. And he says, Sir, you got this hog in here, now take her out. <laughs> and he wanted to go back to bed what he wanted mm -hmm. so it, it was my my crew was satisfied uh, and, and he returned the, the 28 patients back to England safely and back to Grove okay. 
And there they receive specialized treatment. Abdominal wounds, head wounds, things of this sort, broken bones. And um, <clears throat> when you returned back to your base, did, um, did you see your commanding officer, the one who had told you to abort? No, he was long gone to bed. And he, his day was finished. But uh, uh, did you eventually encounter him, maybe the next day? or? I'll, t I'll tell you what it was. Yeah. Uh, when we got finally landed at Greenham Commons, uh, and we're taxiing to the revetment to put the aircraft to bed for the night, uh, the enlisted men that normally drove jeeps were acting a little strange, as though they didn't want to look me in the face or in the eye. And uh, I didn't say anything. One of them finally came up to me and said, Lieutenant, uh, Captain Beard wants to see you. Captain Beard was the operations officer. He was in charge of the whole thing from when we first started, right after briefing that morning. And here it is, it's 2.30 in the morning. He's had a long night and he's, he's pissed. Uh, but when I walked in, uh, they said, he, he, he wants to see you right now. I went up and I knocked on his door and nothing happened. And so I knocked again and then I heard a voice say, come in. So I opened the thing and uh, stepped in and I s saluted and stood at attention. And uh, he's sitting behind his desk and he's got a, a, a pencil with a rubber tip on it and he's bouncing the rubber tip off his desk. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm, I'm standing there like this and I'm wondering what's gonna happen next. Uh, and finally it, it got to be a little overbearing and he said, uh, uh, Lieutenant, have you ever noticed that on the left side, down by your left hand, when you're flying, there's a, 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 a mechanical button you can actually push and talk to people? He said, all you have to do is you, you reach down and disengage it from the side of the aircraft, uh, tune the channel you want to do, press the button and speak into it, and you can talk to people. And I didn't dare comment on that. I mean, what, what was I going to say? No, I don't know that. You learn that the first day. Uh, and I don't remember all the conversation. He wasn't going to let me leave me alone for a while. Uh, he said, "Well, if, I, I remember him saying, well, if you think you're going to get a medal, you're thinking wrong. I said, no, sir, no, no medal. And then he said, well, a after he had me brief, very briefly, I did this and that and that and that and that. And uh, he's getting ready to, to dismiss it. He, and he said, well, he said, well, Harry, if I, uh, if I had a choice, I probably would give you a medal. But if I did, I'd have to tell the story. And how do you think they're going to accept the fact that you disobeyed a, an order in time of war? And, you, and then, I mean, the full impart hit me. I would have lost my wings and my commission and no airline pilot for my, the rest of my life. Uh, I just sucked it up and I took whatever he wanted to dish out. And then he said dismissed and that was it. But... Uh, Enlisted men were kind of shy about uh, entering into it with their, uh, their input or anything like that. They, they just wouldn't do it. That was kind of shocked me a little. I flew so many practice missions that either were equal to this or maybe even a little worse, in the States during my instruction. So I had no doubt that I could do it. 
just absolutely no doubt. Uh, anyway, it, when I got back to my Quonset hut, there were 13 of us uh, below the net. No one said a word. They said, hey, where you been? They just took it for granted. But they were all uh, uh, veterans of, of the D-Day drop, and they made a lot of mistakes on, on the D-Day drop. Uh, they scattered their troopers everywhere. Nobody ever mentioned it, though. They just didn't, didn't do that. And everyone's doing the best job they know how, and they're putting their life on the line. Uh, somehow, or other, your life doesn't mean that much at a time like that. Whenever you're, you're balancing two rubber balls or whatever, it's just, you, by putting your life on the line, it doesn't add much weight to your side. Because everybody did it. <coughs> everybody. Not just one. And was that the last time you uh, you disobeyed orders? Oh my, yes. <laughs> to my knowledge, I don't remember ever disobeying an order. Most of the time, that, though, I was a flight leader, so uh, I was giving orders as well as uh, following them. And um, are there any other missions that stick out in your mind? Other than following Patton and the fact that we landed at some more than one time, we landed at uh, fields that weren't yet, yet captured. Uh, and we were subject to some pretty heavy small arms fire. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're carrying in uh, resupply fuel and... Everything from socks and shoes uh, to medicine, to gasoline, oil, it's all everything it takes to run a war. And what type of defenses did your uh, airplane have to protect itself against the enemy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we had no defense. Uh, on Market Garden, five days in a row we went in at really low altitudes, but once we went in about 300 feet with double glider toe. Uh, and I remember flying along uh, the very first time that we could see flak. And we saw this flak hitting up in front of us. It was coming out of uh, ACAC guns logs uh, on barges in, in the canals. Uh, in Holland, and uh, we, I lost a, a trend of thought on that. I don't want to emphasize. Oh, yeah. Uh, when you see flak, or when you're in an aircraft and you're flying along and you see uh, flak, Usually it'll be out ahead of you because you don't see anything behind you. So you'll see that it'll go off. And if you're a long way off, and by a long way, I don't know, maybe a hundred yards or so, you see it, it'll like this, and then gradually you'll fly through it. But when you're, when we were down low and, and flying along and they were really peppering us, it was right out in front of our nose, and you, you'd, you'd see the uh, ac ac shrapnel burst open. It, it'd be, pew, and we'd be through it. That meant that they were really right on our nose, and we we're about to get our ass kicked. Uh, and, but it's, you're part of a large con contingent. And it goes on and on and on, and finally, you know, you run out of their range below you, uh, so they can't uh, hit you. And the the airplanes that got knocked down, well, you don't know it because they're behind you. My right wingman was on the third day in the hall, and my right wingman, 
uh, his name was Kerry, and his nephew wrote a book about him. Uh, he was, we're, all, we're flying along in this double glider tow, which when we had four ship echelon to the right, four C-47s and eight gliders. Uh, and when they hit him, my people, I was in the lead plane, and then there was this guy, he was on my right wing, and then two others, the third and the fourth. Uh, and they, in interviewing them later, by the, they, they said they saw a puff of smoke in the cockpit, so he probably took a round directly in the cockpit. And he was dead from that moment on. Uh, but they said he, his nose dropped down just a very little, and a very slight bank to the left. And he came around to the uh, to the left, and he didn't hit us because he he is underneath us. Uh, and he he almost in the circle, but he didn't. In fact, he hit the ground and blew up. And there's a memorial there with a, a monument with the names of the crew to this day. I, I've got a copy of it. And I have a copy, I have a photograph of his tail section, and it shows G, 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 I think it's, it's H, 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 and then the last three digits are 770, and mine was G, 769. So my plane was. And I've got this as a, a memento. They sent me a copy of it. And what goes through your head when, uh, when you have a plane go down, and especially somebody as close as, as your wingman? You, uh, you, it's difficult to accept. That's the first thing. You always believe that they're going to be able to maneuver their way out of it. Uh, Avent lost his life that way, it's, and some others. Uh, so there's not much you can do, and it's a feeling of hopelessness. I didn't see because he was on my wing, uh, Carrie. I didn't see the burst in in the cockpit. Other aircraft saw it. Uh, and at the debriefing, why they, they they just tell it and say, when you get to your Quonset hut, all of his belongings are gone, and uh, his bunk is everything's been stripped off of it, the blankets and, and the sheets and stuff like that, and then the the blank the mattress just doubled over, so you have a an empty cot with a doubled over mattress on it, and that's what you have as to where he was that morning. Uh, and they won't allow anything else to be done. Uh, if, you, if you're shot down, they want you out of the picture. It, it's, uh, I think, uh, a good psychological ploy because the, you can't control the mind sometimes. It'll just do funny things for you. And because when you look over, uh, it's, it's, it's from here maybe to the corner there. And normally you see him, and he'd be, oh, he's a character. A good guy, good guy. So you, you think about him, and, and then you, you concentrate more or less on him. So he's there that morning, and then that afternoon, you go he's back gone. that evening, and he's gone. There's nothing left of him. Just the, the empty, the empty bunk. Empty bunk. It must be a pretty lonely feeling too, though, seeing all you know, just an empty. 
the first time it happens, uh, yes, uh, perhaps. Uh, I don't remember it ever affecting me. Uh, I, I just remember that I was astounded that they got rid of all the evidence that uh, someone lived on, and he was part of the 13. So, and, and did they replace that bunk pretty quickly? Did they get yeah. a new, new guy in there? Oh, yeah, see they had replacements coming in all, all the time. Mm -hmm. And the, the co-pilot and the I can't say whether the the radio operator or not, but the co-pilot on that on Kerry's flight, he was a replacement from the day before. So we we had five days in a row, and these were all thousand plane missions or more or better, and it was a what we, what we call maximum effort. But young people are so stupid. It doesn't mean anything. It, 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 it's, you're not looking at, well, when I turn 50, why well, they'll recognize the fact that I did this or I did that. That's not true. I mean, you, you give your best effort and hoping the hell that you're gonna end this war. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you, when it doesn't happen, you're back out the next morning. Uh. So for Market Garden, um, did you were you carrying um, supplies in, or did you did you drop any paratroopers in? Uh, I'm going to see if I can remember this. The first day was we dropped paratroopers. The second day we we dropped gliders, single gliders. The third day was double glider tow. And then the fourth day it was a parapack resupply. And the, the fifth day it was uh, the rest of the paratroopers. So, um, parapack resupply is that uh, dropping supplies mm -hmm. via parachute? Is that yeah, what that means? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and do you know um, <clears throat> which which airborne group the paratroopers? Hundred and first airborne, the five hundred and second regiment. Five hundred two. Yeah. And about how many paratroopers did you have on board? There was a standard stick, they called it, of 18. So every plane would, would be carrying 18. Uh, so if they, not the gliders per se, but uh, every every plane on when we're dropping troopers, this crew of 18. Uh, some bad things happen. I mean, some of those young men got shot standing in the doorway. From your plane? N no, not my plane. Uh, uh, but on planes from the 438th. And that was a daytime mission, correct? Daytime yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, all of uh, Margaret Garden was day daytime. All of Market Garden. Now we we were also busy later, after that, in taking back wounded, and we, we took back tons of wounded. Is that uh, where you were landing in uh, fields that that had not been taken yet, or was that a different? No, no, that's different. Okay. The fields were was patent. So where were you landing when you were picking up uh, the wounded? Oh, we, we landed uh, uh, in the town that's called uh, that had that bridge too far. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, it wasn't a field; it was a, a runway that the engineers had carved out, and we just landed there. And uh, let me tell you about this this one. Uh, now this is in September end of September that we're, we're talking about. And we landed the aircraft and we taxied up and we're nose to tail parked 
and then nose to tail part, nose to tail part, and uh, they load abdominal wounds on the, the first X number, then on uh, head wounds on another, then on broken bones uh, on, on another, and they fill up all these aircraft and then they turn them loose and they just go out and take off and head for Grove. And that went on for quite a while. A lot of the uh, wounded that we carried back were British uh, paratroopers that were caught by, uh, in uh, German uh, What, what do you call it? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. They they were hit by German flamethrowers, and they they couldn't get out of this bridge too far. That's why a special uh, number of planes with recruits that were sent in to relieve the pressure. Montgomery is the one that caused all that. By the way, he he really screwed up big time, but. Uh, these British Lammers were hit by German flamethrowers. And we had them like four, maybe five days later. And you're sitting in the sun in a hot DC-3, no air conditioning, and you want to retch. It's tough not to retch. But we would have to listen to what our superiors would say to us, better they hear than you. So where would you rather be? So we, we could buckle down then, but you never get used to that smell. Burned flesh. Just not. We, the United States trapped two German armies in what is known as the Fallet Gap. And we didn't participate in that because that we were busy with the Paris uh, and the, the the carnage that they wrecked on those German armies. They just completely destroyed them, killed all their animals, their horses and mules, and all that kind of stuff, and and killed them. And. Uh, I could smell it at 4,500 feet. And I, I, in my debriefing uh, that one day, I, uh, it was part of my debriefing. And boy, man, I, we, we were fine until we hit this area, and then this, the air outside, when we brought it in, it had rotten flesh. And boy, that's a, a bad, bad smell. But we, we spent a lot of time. Oh, and the, the Germans had, had a twin-engine jet fighter. Now think about this. This is in late August of 44. And the United States doesn't even have a jet fighter. They have a twin-engine jet fighter. And that thing made... A, a, many passes. The problem was, and we're waiting to be loaded up and waved off uh, back to England, and you'd hear tally-ho, and that would be the British with a Spitfire up high, and then you'd, there'd be an, an American with a, a uh, P-51, and then a Spitfire, and all three of them would be after this one twin-engine jet, and they would peel off and go to max, never exceed speed. They couldn't catch him. They, they, they couldn't get close enough to fire at him. It, it was a, a, a weird, weird sensation because they, they lost him every time. We sat uh, on, on that runway uh, long enough to uh, load five aircraft. And by that Flights, five flights of, of aircraft. It just just couldn't couldn't catch him. 
Later I, uh, I saw one up close. And it, it was in a, 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 bomb, a bombed out uh, hangar. And it, sure enough, it, it was sophisticated looking and it looked fast as hell and it was. It was really fast. It was the ME-262 is the designation. And I'd say that if the Germans had been successful in not fooling with Russia, just concentrate on England, we'd all be speaking German today. And that's the God's truth. We, we, we couldn't match the technology that the Germans had. They're intelligent people, very intelligent. Great engineers. Yep, that's what it is, it's engineering. Um, and you mentioned, uh, you know, I know you have recorded 20, 27 missions, but you mentioned that some days you would fly multiple uh, flights. I get credit for one. Right, so... Um, yeah. How many, how many times would you do multiple flights? Oh, not that often because it, it, it had to do with Patton and the fact that we were trying to keep him moving. He, he was boy, he, pretty quick. Huh? Oh my, he 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 was a gutsy general, a real gutsy general, and he he wasn't afraid to stick his tanks out there to where they were exposed. In fact, uh, there were times when we supplied him with gasoline on uh, the, this went straight directly into the tanks. They had the guys there ready to unload. They, instead of unloading and, and, and parking it and uh, uh, storing it, they just emptied it directly into the, ta the, the tanks. And, uh, now, we, we didn't get to see that part of the war. Uh, when we had to unload the gasoline ourselves, we each grabbed a hold of one five gallon on each side and took it out of the airplane and stored it outside. And as soon as we got the last one out, we were gone. There was no accolades, nothing. Let's get the hell out of here. Um, and Captain Beard, uh, he was the operations officer that night that, that I messed up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, yeah, he rode a uh, check pilot uh, on me one day, and we landed in this field, and uh, there was nobody to greet us. And so I just took charge, and uh, I. I said, okay, everybody line up. We're going to uh, unload this thing ourselves, and we're going to do it right now. Camp Beard, you, you're number one. And he jumped in there, and we got that thing done in a heartbeat. But before we got it done, we took small arms fire from, because it was in a little valley, tiny little valley. and But there were Germans with small arms, rifles and stuff, that were peppering us with small arms fire. And none of us got hit with it, though. The planes got hit, uh, but none of us. It's more more of an annoyance than. <laughs> I wish I could say that was nothing more than an annoyance. I was scared spitless. <laughs> uh, still got a job to do, though, huh? Oh, you just go do it. Yeah. 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 You go. You have to unload it. Yeah. And, and then ha they have a, a quartermaster man, and he'll have a manifest, and he'll, uh, he'll sign it, and then I sign it, and we, we jump on the airplane, and we're gone. So the incentive uh, to get it all unloaded is that you can get out of there and, and stop getting Absolutely. shot Absolutely. Well, to save your life. Sure. Yeah, of course. So th uh, aside from that one instance or... Uh, did you have any other close calls during your your time overseas? I can't think of anything close to what I experienced in the commercial. I, I experienced some close calls in commercial that defy description, really. 
And we're talking after you get out of the military. Yeah, and, and have a job on the airline and been there a while, etc. So it's a complete different story. But most of the time, everyone stuck by the rules. And you know, we had adequate separation altitude-wise. Uh, and we we're trying to all head in the same direction, mm -hmm. not, not scattered. You never had to had to bail out of a, a plane or no, I, I I did the practice down at Fort Bragg. Yeah, yeah, and that all that did is that qualified me to instruct in paratroop dropping. Mm -hmm. I had to check out in a, a CG four A, mm -hmm. which is a, a glider. Uh, it was fun. And, and of course, excuse me just a second, something about Fort Bragg, when you, you jumped, why the parachute uh, uh, canopy was all hooked onto this mechanical d device, and it it never went changed its shape going down, but you had that full canopy. And But they were teaching you how to, to jump out and uh, throw your shoulders, your head and your shoulders back and your uh, your legs and it puts you in a nice position relative to the wind. Uh, it, anyway. Now going back to uh, day one of Market Garden, uh, as you're dropping the paratroopers, now about about what altitude are you flying at? What speed are you flying for, at? Uh, for uh, for paratroopers, we were five to six hundred feet, uh, and we have what is called an IP initial point. And that IP, no matter how big an organization you have, you have to come over. Everyone comes over that IP, and you pick your target out from from a heading from there. Uh, And let me think the rest of it. Anyway, that's where you start, and you're 600 feet. You're known as in the slot and on the numbers. And that means that you and your flight are where they belong at the right altitude and the right speed, and you just go from there. And then when you drop paratroopers, or you have to get rid of that rope, uh, if you're, uh, excuse me, if you're towing gliders. Mm -hmm. But with paratroopers, no, you just hit it home. And, and what almost everyone does is they'll make a left turn out and a max climb, and uh, go as fast a rate of ascent as possible. So you want to get up to 5,000 feet. It's difficult using a rifle to hit someone a mile away. So that was our goal. Now, uh, when you guys are heading for the initial point and ready to, to drop the paratroopers, is there's a... Is a do you communicate with the jump master as far as? Oh, he's in, the jump master's in the plane. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, so do you let him know that you're getting close to? Absolutely, he's in direct contact with the the uh, copilot. Okay. Yeah. And were you guys taking on flak uh, at at that point when you got? Yeah. There? Now you didn't get so much at the initial point. Mm -hmm. But as the day wore down, why it, it kept coming, uh, the initial point that, or, or, or flak kept coming out, uh, because they they would bring reinforcements in, and it would get heavier and heavier. Not uh, pilots are a weird group. That doesn't didn't bother us, uh, and the increase in the risk was never considered. I mean, that's not part of the equation. Interesting. 
And you mentioned uh, when you were towing gliders, you had to get rid of the rope. Right. So let's say we're, we're towing single gliders. Uh, you come in it, it, from the IP. You If it's a single glider, you're about 450 to 500 feet high, and you're about 115 miles an hour. So you're pretty pretty big target, and it's slow. Uh, you, you, you make sure you're in a slot and on the numbers, and, and you take up your heading to your particular drop zone, and you, you get there, and the gliders cut loose. Uh, now, if they don't cut loose, then the crew chief cuts them loose. And, uh, and then we, we continue and we do a, a left turn out of the drop zone area and j drop the ropes because you can't carry those ropes around with you. They'll, they'll kill you. They'll get tangled in something and, and pull you down. We just did, did that with single and double rider tow. Now, are there any other any other missions that um, you can speak on that are stick out in your in your mind at all? Or? No, and uh, they're humdrum. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been over my logbook one day at a time, and uh, a, a lot of missions where we. For instance, we hauled uh, bandages, socks, shoes, caps, things like that. And a whole airplane, or maybe more than one airplane. Uh, we, we did that many, many times. Anyway, that's. Pretty humdrum, right? It, I mean, you could you could say that it sounds insignificant, but it, I don't think so. You know, it's, it, it's, it's all the necessities of, of the uh, to complete the mission of living. Yeah, sure. you want to keep them alive, sure. and you don't want them to have frostbite or anything like that because that incapacitates a a, a lot of every everyone the, the medical as well. What was your involvement with Bastogne? Uh, Bastogne was uh, being overrun by the Germans, of course. That was the Ardennes salient battle, and uh, were you guys grounded for yeah for a period of time? Yep. Prior to that, this was one day before Christmas in '44, and one day after Christmas in '44, and. Uh, we were uh, loaded up and said, you know, we, we've got a mission. We were briefed on everything and why we needed to do this. And we just went in and uh, the first day, uh, was, I, I had to check my logbook to see whether it was a, a, a gliders or not. I, it seemed, doesn't seem to me that it was gliders, but... Uh, I know we just went in one time that that twenty fourth of December, and then we flew back home and uh, we weren't in time for dinner, so Christmas dinner. So they fixed a special meal for us. They kept it out uh, in reserve, and that night we all got sick. And you talk about the runs, and, and you, here you have a, a whole squadron, of, and everybody is really hacked and short-tempered and, and everything. And But we recovered over Christmas, uh, and the next day we did it again. So. It, it might have been Parapax. And when was your, your last mission? When did you fly your last mission? The last mission was the uh, uh, jumping, <laughs> jumping the Rhine. 
and that had to do with uh, not just C-47, but C-46s. Do you know what that is? It's a twin engine, but it's a big Hummer. Um, we first flew them when we were resupplying the B-24s with gasoline because it could carry a lot of gas. would land up close to the front. The B-24s would land and be uh, supplied with fuel. And then they would go on with their mission from there. And we didn't head, head home. So, so yeah, we had a, a lot of that. But the C-46s carried more paratroopers. I don't remember the, the exact number I should, but I don't. I did not instruct in the C-46s. They had a larger engine, even though it's only a twin engine. They had a lot more power, so they could handle a lot more weight. All in all, the, the last one was a, a cakewalk, really was. No German fighters at all, none. So you must have known that the, the end of the war was coming. Yeah, of course, and, and the reason is, uh, the entire C-47 fleet uh, was assigned to returning ex slave laborers and ex-prisoners of war to their home country. I flew many, 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 many missions where the French, the British, the Belgians, the Dutch, the Poles, you think of any country that had slave laborers when they were captured and put to work as slaves. And, we, and we, we spent our entire time, literally, during that particular period. And it was on uh, May the 8th was the, the, the day the war was over. So these are um, Polish citizens, French citizens that were in Russians. <clears throat> Russian citizens, too. I got to tell you this one. I just want to, uh, before you do, though, I just want to make sure I understand correctly that um, these were, these were uh, other uh, residents of these countries that were enslaved by the Germans. Yeah. You were returning to their homeland. Right. Got it. Okay. Uh, this this one day I was uh, instructed to go to Belgium and uh, a small I hadn't been in there a small airport and we were loaded up with Russians I couldn't believe it one a young good looking young man black wavy hair dimples flashy smile good attitude the whole ball of wax and he he wanted to know if he could come up front and, and see the, the, the front of it. We let him up front and uh, uh, we had, uh, for barf bags, we had buckets that sat in the middle of the aisle. Uh, he barked out orders to some of the guys and they went and got the, the, the buckets. And at the same time, they, uh, unloaded their pockets and gave us all of these Belgian francs. I wouldn't t touch it. I, I couldn't do that. Uh, but some of my crew did. And I just said, let me, s I got to check something over here. And I would look out the window. And I, I can truthfully say, no, I didn't see that happen. But uh, Anyway, they, what this young man told me, uh, I said, no, I, we can't do this. And he says, sir, you must take this. He said, when we get into Russia, he said, they will execute every one of us. And I didn't believe, it, believe that. Uh, so I had him repeat it a couple of times. And I, I said, why? He said, nobody is allowed out of Russia. You're not, you're not allowed to exist outside of Russia, especially be exposed to some other form of government. 
we flew up to a place called Holly, H-A-L-L-E. Um, I can't remember if it was another E or not, but Holly, Germany. Uh, because this is where we're going to land so and drop off our load. But see, I get to have it signed off. So the manifest I sign will be canceled when I deliver the, the prisoners. And uh, there was a, an American lieutenant colonel. And uh, I got out of the seat and went back to make sure everything was going to be done properly. And uh, he was busy getting everyone aligned and in order and then loaded onto these trucks, and I went up to him and I said, Colonel, what's the deal on these? I, I said, we got a ton of these guys, I said, uh, that were flying in here. What, what's the deal on them? He said, oh, the Russians will execute them. And I said, is that true? And I looked him straight in the eye and he said, absolutely. He said, no one, he may have reference to how long it would take to execute all of them. He said, everyone will be executed. And that's, that's bad news. I carried, uh, I landed at one field with a big grass plane. Uh, and as we're approaching it, I looked, I can see where it's supposed to be, but there's a, just a big black mass, like a fire had burned it. And I got closer and closer, and fa finally I flew over, and I looked down, and it's people dressed in black. So we landed, and I got out, out of the airplane, and uh, I started talking to some of the ground personnel. And there were men and women, and they're all dressed in the same color, black. Totally, totally uh, black. Uh, and a man and, and a, a woman first broke from the masses, and she ran out into the open, field area and a man ran out behind her and she went to the bathroom and he took off his black jacket and held his jacket up and, and it, it didn't have anything to do with shielding her he couldn't possibly have shield her for anything but that's exactly what happened uh, and, and she went to the bathroom and they, he, he put everything back on her the two of them went back into the mass. Whenever they got on the airplane, uh, uh, we had them all programmed. Uh, the stench was unreasonable. It just, you can't imagine. Human uh, waste and that. Uh, and these people, they couldn't do anything or they'd be shot. They just shoot them, boom, and that's it. But we did it with uh, the Russians and the Belgians, but we, every uh, country that was conquered by Hitler, every one of them. And these don't count towards the 27 combat missions? Right? No, oh no, the war's over. Right. Mm -hmm. So how many of those missions would you say that you, you had flown? Well, thinking about beginning on May the 8th, yeah is when I heard that the war was over. Yeah. We were on a mission then, and we were returning home. Mm -hmm. We had been to, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the, the Belgium. Mm -hmm. We had been to Belgium and dropped off a bunch of Belgian slave laborers. They were captured by uh, Hitler as, and put to work as slave laborers. Had a lot of slave laborers. I mean, time after time after time. I, I had a little ditty that I worked out when uh, someone, when, when the plane was loaded and I would get on board, I would say something in English. 
and if anybody responded, then I knew I could communicate with them. If no one responded, then I knew they didn't speak English. And you'd have to have a trip where nothing is exchanged between you. A British BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, representative was, was captured around, uh, not Nijmegen, uh, Nuremberg. You know where Nuremberg is. Uh, he was captured uh, and held prisoner for a couple of years. And uh, in 19... I'll, I'll say it was probably 1968 or 69. Uh, he was interviewed by someone and they wrote a letter to the uh, BBC and, the, and he was being decorated for something. But he was interviewed by the BBC and he was a member of the BBC reporting reporters. Uh, he he made a call from China to me and said, Harry, he said, Harry, you SOB, he said, you're a friggin' hero. And I, of course, I couldn't just accept that. I said, when we talked, well, I said, well, send me a copy of that. And I still have it today. A copy of the article where this guy is reported as uh, being a prisoner of war, and uh, he they interviewed him, and he said, "Well, the plane, the plane was uh, the Wee Juni," and he said, "With Captain Harry Watson," and he said, "I'll never forget that," and uh, that was all published in BBC, and how they got all that together, I don't know. But that was that was kind of nice, because uh, nothing threatened or anything of that sort. Just just a, a, a good deed that we were able to do. If you had to estimate how many uh, prisoners you returned to their home country, what do you think that number would add up to? Oh my! Well, I think if I had to really give you an answer, I would sit down and figure out how many planes we had on that type of mission. And then I, I did my share. I did my, so if we had 30 planes, I, I did one thirtieth of it. It was, everyone wa wanted to work with you. It, oh, even the Dutch, by the way. The Dutch, we had turned a lot of the Dutch people. So would you estimate uh, thousands Hundreds, thousands. Well, a thousand. Let's let's just say uh, twenty a, a, a time. That's fifty flights. Mm -hmm. Maybe fifteen hundred. Yeah. In your plane alone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um. So when did you? When did you return home? I had a lot of battle points. Because I, I was off the chart myself. Uh, so I was one of the first to be let go. And uh, they asked me to pick out my co-pilot. So I picked out a, a guy named Olette, a Frenchman who never made first pilot. He, he was a uh, co-pilot all that time. But I, I, I split flying time with him on the way home. And we came home to the southern route. And uh, I would say it was probably sometime in July, because May the 8th, June. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say it was sometime in July that they got their act together and awarded those that had the, the, the combat time, or the, the points, they called them, uh, by letting them go home early. Uh, now my co-pilot stayed over there, and he became part of the, the Battle of Berlin. 
And he ended up a lieutenant colonel when I saw him. After, after the war, he was a lieutenant colonel. And I, only, I was only a lieutenant. So he outranked you? Yeah. Of course, he was still in the service and I wasn't. Yeah. Uh, but that was, that was a nice thing, I thought. Um, so let's see. Uh, you mentioned that you, you got discharged in 46. Is that correct? The paperwork was okay. processed for that. I say that because I had uh, uh, vacation time, you know, in the service uh, of so many days. So let's take uh, I I don't really know how much time I had. I know I had it quite a bit. I saw a figure once that had 46, but if I had to actually pinpoint it, I would say that I, I got out uh, uh, sometime in August of 40, 45, yeah. And add on, say, 90 days of uh, vacation time for so August, September, October, November. To be on the safe side where I'm not telling something that's not true, I would say I got out about, I had five years of credit or more. And if I got out in November, that's too early. It doesn't give me the, the correct time that I served. But it, it was never important to me. That, that part when we came in. I loved the fact that Ed Olette and I got to fly home with our own airplane. And we had, oh, by the way, we had a plane load of fighter pilots. <laughs> that, that was a blast. It must have been a fun trip home. Yeah, it was. And we, and we flew across the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Ascension Island is in the middle. Uh, we uh, we hit out of uh, Dakar, I believe, out to Ascension Island, and then on to uh, Fortaleza, Brazil, and then up the coast there and home. If you have a uh, a question about in the timing, I can always get my logbook back from this guy, and I'm going to. Okay. Uh, and y if you'll write those down, and then I, I can answer them for you. No problem. With a degree of certainty. All right. Um, now, was there any uh, threat or possibility of you being sent to the Pacific? No. Fly missions over there, or where you, you were done and done. No, when I was done, I was done. Yeah, Got it. I, I, and I made that known, uh, and they didn't need me. When I landed at Savannah, Georgia, because that's where we did land, they took my airplane. <laughs> I hated to see that go. And uh, after you got out of the military, uh, you eventually fulfilled your dream of. Of being a becoming a commercial pilot, you said. That's true, but first, you know, everybody was laying off, everybody, and uh, I was, I needed money to, to live on, so uh, my wife and I rented a, a malt shop, uh, so it's a short order and, and a hamburger uh, shop up in Ridgecrest, California. I mean great money uh, there. I was I averaged about $4,000 a month that I had to pay taxes on. And uh, I, I didn't make anywhere near that in the service, nor when I first got out either. Uh, anyway, I messed around with that and finally I saw the writing on the wall and I told my wife, I said, uh, 
I'm, I can't get on any of these feeder lines because I don't have an ATR. No matter whether I was an instructor or, or what, I have to have American type verification. And it's called an airline transport rating. So I went to a, a school up in Fort Worth called the Reed, Reed Pigman American Flyers. And uh, I paid money to do it, but the government reimbursed me for all of it. And the day I passed my flight check, I was hired. They sent a, a, a telegram to my home in California, and uh, I was hired. And it, it went on for a long, long time. How many years? Uh, 32. I was hired in uh, April of 48, and I quit, actually, I didn't retire, I, I quit uh, in the first day of 1980. And, and I did, I'd had enough, I'd, I had so much flying all my life. What airlines did you fly for? Continental. Your entire career? Oh yes, you never change. Uh, and you mentioned earlier when I asked you if you had any, any close calls, uh, you mentioned, you referred to your commercial uh, pilot career. Not, to, not just the first year. Uh, it, it happened throughout my career. Can you uh, talk about any of them? Yeah. Uh, one guy, that ca I was a brand new co-pilot on the DC-7, and they paired me with a, a, an Indian. His name was McCoy. Uh, he was the captain. And he was a weirdo. Uh, we took took out of Denver one night, uh, headed for Los Angeles, and you know you have the the Rockies begin real quick, so they they usually route you around a, a few. Little, and uh, uh, we're supposed to be at this certain altitude. I, I think it was twenty two thousand. Uh, and and we're level. We we've leveled off, and we look up ahead. And up ahead, there's flashing red light, which means an airliner. And I told Dick, I said, Dick, there's traffic at twelve o'clock, and, and it looks like he's about two, a couple thousand feet above us. And he looked at it and looked at it, and finally he buttoned his seat belt real tight and uh, asked for climb power, and he had the, the second officer give us climb power, and he started climbing up. And I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? He said, I gotta get over him, I gotta get over him. And I said, I, 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 he, back then, you wouldn't dare uh, violate an order from the, the captain, just, just wouldn't dare. Uh, I just asked him, I said, Dick, I, I, I think we need to stay where we are. And it kept getting closer and closer, and it looked like maybe he was climbing, I don't know, but I can't be sure of that. But all at once, uh, we look up and here, it's a huge image of a, a jet, uh, not a jet, uh, a DC-8. And he went right directly over us, a matter of, of yards. Scared the hell out of him, as well as me and, and anyone else. But pastors never knew about it. And uh, he didn't know what to do then. I mean, he, he was pretty well had it. Uh, uh, he later had a party at his house and invited the crew over, just the crew. And it was a kind of a, a, a apologetic party. Uh, it, I had another one that was in broad daylight and we're in clouds. And I, I, I'm still a co-pilot on, on this new, new equipment. And we're, uh, we're supposed to be at 13,000 feet. And uh, we head out uh, out of Albuquerque, and we get up to 
almost 13,000. Uh, and they tell us, the control tells us that uh, we have traffic 12 o'clock at this altitude that we are looking for, plus a few feet. Uh, and that's just an advisory is all. They're not guiding you anywhere. But we're right in the tops of all these clouds, and it's bumpy as hell because uh, they have ups and down, up and down currents. Uh, anyway, Gene Hershey was flying, and he uh, he muttered some, a few things that I didn't understand. But I told him that I, I I thought we were we needed to descend a little, and he starts arguing with me, and finally he turns around to be looking straight ahead, and whew, the air it was another Continental aircraft at thirteen thousand feet went right over our heads, just a, a so. So fast that it left an imprint, and I could, I could visualize, I pull it up in my mind, mind's eye. Then said, "Cal, I even saw the numbers," and sure enough, I was right. But uh, here, this guy was a, a good captain, uh, although he, on his. Graduation flight to go into retirement, he crashed at DC-10. Yeah. He's he a hard-headed Dutchman. Yeah, and that created a lot of heroes because some of my friends were riding non-revenue on, uh, on that flight. And they never got off the ground, but uh, they, the gear tore holes in the gas tanks, and that all started burning. And this one friend of mine, who now he's, he's dead, uh, he said that uh, he was standing in. Uh, this jet fuel up above his ankles and and he said there's no fire he said but Harry it was I knew it was going to be just a matter of minutes or seconds before it, it, it caught on fire and by then why all the fire trucks and everything came and they had foam you know the foam that they used so they foamed him down good they kept the aircraft from burning is what they did but Two people, two older people, decided they 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 can't do it the way the trained employees employees are doing. So they open a side window and walk out on the wing, and it caught on fire and they fell off, and they were, of course, died right there. They were an older couple. Anyway, I flew into Vietnam. For four years, and uh, I got hit many, many times. Especially coming in to, for landing at Tan San Ut, the Saigon, and also Da Nang. Da Nang was a a hotbed of VC. These are commercial flights, though, while yeah. the Vietnam War is going on, yeah. and they're taking pot shots at. at Oh, they all, they always laid off the edge of the runways and took pot shots. And, and they hit you, but uh, even though they hit me in the bottom where the, the tanks were, the tanks are protected by one layer of metal and then a little bit of uh, air space, etc. So it, it, it couldn't leak out fast enough to do any harm. So I, I, I was lucky. I didn't even know that I was hit until I got on the ground, so... What are you going to do? <laughs> Pretty dangerous stuff. If you equate it to jumping in your car and going down to the 7-Eleven, yes. Yeah. 
You can always get what you want down at 7-Eleven, so. So how do you respond when, uh, when people call you a hero? I'm, I make it clear I'm no hero. I am not. The heroes didn't come home. I didn't tell you about the guy that, uh, a Mormon that uh, was a state mile champion in Utah. The first day of uh, uh, physical training in cadets that we, we had, uh, they ended, uh, ended up with a mile run. Now we have, this is the first day out there, so a lot of them ne never finished a mile. Some that did just end up puking all over the place. We took out running, and uh, I was only five feet eight, uh, and I had been a, a, a half miler in high school. So I, I thought I knew something. I didn't know Golden Lang, though. Uh, we, we took off running. At the half mile mark, I was ahead. But I, I, I realized I'm ahead, but I'm struggling. And I got a half mile to go. So I, I tried to stay there, and sure enough, I, I stayed there till the three quarter mile mark. And then he just lengthened his stride a little bit and he just gradually pulled away from me. <laughs> I, I felt so helpless. I, and I'd run a lot of races, uh, uh, so I knew what it was like to lose to a more talent. Uh, anyway, he, uh, when it was all over, I, with my hands on my knees and bent over and breathing as deep as I could, and he come up and put his arm around me. He says, hey, old buddy. He says, uh, I, you probably don't know it, but I was a state mile champion in Utah. <laughs> and I, I, I remember I raised up and said something to the effect, ah, oh, they kick your butt. <laughs> but we became uh, close friends all the way through training, all the primary training, basic and advanced. And we got our wings and we flew together and everything. Uh, and then he came to me one day and said, listen, old buddy, he says, you, you know and I know we're not going to survive this war. We're too wild. And I said, so? Uh, and he said, I'm going to marry my high school sweetheart. I had never had a date in, in high school. Never had a date. Not one. So I didn't know who the hell to marry. But I'd been to a USO dance the night of graduating from basic into advance. And uh, we danced all night, and, and she was a really good dancer. So uh, I thought, well, I'll ask her. I did, and she accepted. I'd only seen her one time and never in the daylight. And when she and her mother got off the train up in Stockton, uh, I wondered, boy, I'm an officer and a gentleman, but I mean, is this part of it? <laughs> anyway, we were married 17 years and had four great children. We've lost That's one. An embarrassing story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a truth. I know. So Golden Lang died 15 days after the end of the war. Uh, he was killed on uh, the war ended on May the 8th and, and he was killed on the, the 23rd or something like that. What's funny, my, my, my memory is just really acting up. Okay, May the 8th, April, April 23rd. So April 23rd, and then May the 8th. So the 23rd is, 
there's seven days, and then that the eighth is eight months. Well, it's fifteen days before the end of the war, and and he was instructing in B-24s in Smyrna, Tennessee, and ran into another aircraft and killed everybody on both aircraft. I I've agonized over that many many times because. My life would have been changed if I, uh, if he had lived. Uh, he's a Mormon, but he was a great, great guy. Anyway, that's my life. Yeah. Uh, is there any advice that you'd be able to offer my generation or future generations? Uh, yes. Uh, someday. When everything has settled down in your life, step out into the moonlight on a dark, starry night and ponder the difference between eternity and what's the other? Infinity. A infinity. And see if you can come up with or the uh, the trigger for life uh, it, it'll start you thinking and it'll, you'll, you'll start to think in the correct way uh, it's uh, regard I've done some things in my life that it would just it takes the rest of the afternoon to by sticking to the axiom of never give up I, I coached two national championships in Pop Warner football and in high school I was a, a left half and I was a s scrub and I had to start all over for myself to learn how to but I, I was able to put together Farmers Branch, Texas Athletic Association. And the last year was 1961 that we won the second national championship. And uh, we beat the Buena Park Bears 52-6. Uh, to six. But we beat everybody by those kinds of numbers, everybody. And we played uh, uh, Utah and Shreveport and uh, different towns in the s southeast. Not Tennessee, but another one of the teams around there. And, and these teams, I mean, they had everything. They had trainers and all this jazz. And all we had was the will and the fact that we were champions and we're going to show them. You had a good leader too. Well, I, I taught them you know, about leadership and the, the fact that you never give up and you never play dirty. You just don't do that. That destroys everything. Well, I want to thank you very much for sharing your story with me. Thank you for your service and thank you for my freedom. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. I truly am. Uh, the little bit that I did isn't enough to warrant the loss of Lang uh, or the loss of other buddies. Just not enough. But if one person like you survives and comes up with one tidbit that he's able to use, then my life was worth it.